Brooklyn is home to numerous different neighborhoods, each having their own distinct culture and history. And among them is the modern-day heartland of the Yiddish language, a language that for centuries was spoken by Jews all across Europe. However, today, while very few Yiddish speakers remain in Europe, the place where the language is primarily spoken and continues to grow is right here in Brooklyn, New York. My grandparents, all of my grandparents, and me and my wife are all Holocaust survivors. And um, some of them even had to start anew. They lost a wife and children and had to rebuild. After the war, like a few hundred survivors came to the ship, actually. Uh, they stopped in at the port, and this is where they settled. Here in Williamsburg. Right. And from those few hundred people, we marry young, we have big families. Uh, now we have hundreds and thousands of uh, these speakers and all of Mars descendants from these few hundred people. Yeah, they brought the language with them, and uh, la language is actually it's not so, it's just a language, it's, it's what keeps us apart. Because we try as much as we can to preserve our religion and traditions. So it's quite common for children to basically grow up speaking Yiddish until yes. they go out to school. And yes, some people grow up and never speak English. <laughs> there are some people like they're born and raised in, in New York and basically speak very bad English mm. because they, you can do everything here yeah. just just walking outside you can all the shops and everything you can just get around speaking Yiddish. Yiddish right when it comes to like political views uh, and I think a lot of people are mistaken about this that Hasidic Jews are anti-Zionist we're anti-Zionist but in a certain way we are against the idea of creating a Jewish state before the coming of the Messiah. Mm. So we try to distance ourselves from them. But, but not it's so... It's not that we support Hamas or, or terror or organizations. You, yeah, so, so or you want to destroy the state of Israel. No, but, yeah. I mean, we travel to Israel and we have our own communities there. Some rabbis believe that you're not allowed to have our own state, mm -hmm. regardless. Mm. So that's the Satmar point of view. Okay, and that's like the general view that you would yeah. find here in, in Williamsburg, I guess, right? Whereas in Crown Heights, it's, it's very it's different. It's different, yes. Yeah. They have their own uh, yeah. different uh, way to... Just like any other place where Jews settled, there was a Judeo whatever where they were living. So let's say, for example, there was uh, when they lived in the Persian Empire, it was Judeo-Persian. When they lived in Italy, it would have been Latin. And we do have uh, remnants of the Latin today in our Yiddish. Let's say, for example, we um, say uh, a blessing after we eat, grace after meal. Um, we call that benching, Benedict. That would come from the uh, Latin word. We also have names that come from the uh, times that we spent um, in Italy, such as, let's say, uh, you have uh, Bela, Bella, you have uh, Sprinza, Esperanza. You have different things that are mixed into uh, the Yiddish language that will kind of be taken from that period of time. Now, Jews were also restricted in the jobs that they were able to do. So let's say, for example, we know banking, money lending was uh, illegal. So the Jews were able to do money lending. The Jews weren't able to own land. They were cobblers, tailors, uh, etc. And um, over the course of time, as the uh, community is growing, how many uh, tailors could you have in one area? How many uh, money lenders could you have in an area? So they're expanding and they're moving upwards. And as they're moving upwards, they're going closer and closer to France. They're getting closer to the French um, neighborhoods. They're moving into France. They're also, can't really cross directly over the Alps, so they're coming around and they're going uh, to Germany as well. And at that particular time, they were <clears throat> very welcomed um, by the Germans. And those Jews that are, that are settling there are kind of moving more towards the Poland. Once they moved there, Germany, they felt the Germans were kind of like more of a higher society type of people at that time. They took on their language 
and they kind of lived there in harmony with the Germans for quite some time. So they kind of made the language theirs. Yiddish is comprised mostly of high German, uh, probably 70%, 65 to 70% is high German. The rest of it would be kind of like a mix from just wherever you are at that particular time. Besides that mush, you have 1,500 years that the Jews were, again, you have the Jews living in Babylon. So you have the Talmud and all of um, those writings for that particular time are written in Aramaic. So you're going to find that Yiddish is mixed with uh, Aramaic. A lot of it's going to be Aramaic. So Yiddish isn't just the Mamalushan, the mother tongue, or the jurgan, the jargon that the Jews spoke. It's also going to be uh, mixed with, um, um, it's, it's going to be mixed with uh, the holy tongue, Hebrew. You're going to find that a lot of it is mixed with Aramaic. 1500 years, we have the Talmud and uh, books like that written in Aramaic. So a lot of that's going to get mixed in there. As well as, let's say, when they were living in Poland or Russia, uh, you'll have words mixed in from Polish or Russian or even French. You know, if you look what happened in Germany before the war, most German Jews were assimilated. They were no longer um, religious because of Reform Judaism. They came and said, you know, Judaism is too old-fashioned, we need to change around. But then uh, a big part of Judaism broke off and we call ourselves Orthodox. Mm. But what it really means is original, unchanged. And uh, we kept, you know, the same do you, traditions. Do you use the term Orthodox as well, or do you use... Uh, the um, because uh, Hasidic Judaism is actually a part of Orthodoxy. Okay. Because uh, Hasidic Jews means that we follow the teachings of Rabbi Israel Bashem. He passed away about 250 years ago in Ukraine. And he founded a movement within Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. But not all Orthodox Jews are Hasidic. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you go to Lakewood, New Jersey, the Lithuanian Jews, they're not Hasidic, but they're Orthodox. Okay. So there's no really big difference. It's just a way of thinking. It's a way of, you can knock certain things, mm -hmm. but um, the basis is the same thing. I grew up in Lakewood, New Jersey, which is a majority ultra-Orthodox town, um, one of the few in the U.S. It is not a Hasidic community, um, but rather the other part of the ultra-Orthodox community, also known as Yeshivish or Litvish. I grew up speaking both Yiddish and English at home. My dad spoke Yiddish to us. Uh, my mom uh, talked to us in English. In school, we also had a mix of both. I spoke English with most of my classmates, but most of the classes were given in Yiddish, so I grew up with both languages. About the Yiddish language and culture in the post-Holocaust era, um, the history of Yiddish before that, in a nutshell, um, basically um, it split off from pre-modern German about a thousand years ago and was the language of uh, the majority of Ashkenazi Jews in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, the Holocaust destroyed a lot of that, obviously. And when a lot of Yiddish-speaking Jews emigrated to the U.S., uh, they brought their language with them. The majority of them um, stopped speaking it or you know, didn't teach their kids the language, especially those who wanted to assimilate into American culture. The um, main exception to that is the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community, um, which for the most part only immigrated to the U.S. after the Holocaust. So prior to the Holocaust, there was like a flourishing Yiddish culture, um, including, you know, Yiddish theater, you know, there were plays, there were, you know, drinking songs in Yiddish. Um, but the, the ultra-Orthodox community that sort of preserved Yiddish, um, you know, didn't really value culture as such. Um, and, you know, didn't really emphasize the um, cultural aspect of Yiddish. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of secular Jews, uh, they sort of see Yiddish as a way to reconnect with their ancestors, especially, you know, in the face of, like, assimilation, um, which which American culture does like 
or historically did put a lot of pressure to like to like assimilate and like you know downplay you know those things that like make someone you know unique um i think some of it is also in the context of how hebrew became so important um with with like the modern zionist movement and the state of israel and hebrew is taught in in, in most jewish schools and and it is sort of like a jewish lingo franca today and i think some of the rediscovery of yiddish is a way to say that there's an, an alternative to that and there's you know other forms of of um you know jewish linguistic identity and, and culture that, that we can be proud of in almost every diasporic community the jews have lived in they've ended up speaking by a natural process their own sort of Jewish version of the local language. So there's Judeo-Malayalam and Judeo-Farsi and Judeo-Sicilian. And then there's Yiddish, which is a kind of Judeo-German, although of course with a lot of other influences. And what all of these languages have in common is that they're versions of a language from the community where these Jews lived, but generally written in the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and taking all sorts of loan words and influences from Hebrew and from another ancient Jewish language, which is Aramaic, and ends up being its own thing that the Jews speak amongst themselves. They were always very often living in somewhat insular communities and uh, had, it was natural that they had this language that was their own language. One thing that's unique about Yiddish is that I, to my understanding, it's, it's a lot more distinct from the source language than other Jewish languages are. Like, you know, like Judeo-Spanish Judeo is like, or like Ladino is like, I think far more similar to Spanish than Yiddish is to German. Um, and I think this is partially because, you know, Jews started speaking a Germanic language and then relatively quickly moved away from a Germanic speaking area to a Slavic speaking area for the most part. And so like, we're not, we're like no longer in regular contact with the German speaking world. And so this like German language became like, it, it, it became like Jewish in people's imagination, like, like these words, like it's it's always weird for me to like listen to German because there are all of these words that like like it's like feel Jewish to me because I know them from Yiddish, yeah. um, but the, you know they, they came from somewhere. But like also because people had moved away from the larger German speaking community, the language was also free to move in its own direction grammatically and was adopting influences from like Slavic languages. Jews did not take on speaking Polish in general. They found that when they were moving to Poland, possibly that they were kind of like peasants at the time. So they didn't feel like they can kind of like, um, they, they, they didn't feel that they were up to that same standard. They were also very illiterate. They weren't illiterate people. The Jews always uh, have been one of their big uh, points is that even a, a little child learns how to read the, uh, learns how to read the, 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 the Hebrew alphabet. And therefore, because there wasn't necessarily a, uh, a form of uh, letters or was only available to, let's say, priests or the higher society, Jews themselves, the way you write Yiddish is with um, the Hebrew um, uh, letters. So when you're writing something, you're writing it with the, the, the Hebrew uh, letters. Um, and they didn't really take on that language. Obviously, when they were doing business with the Poles or with the Russians, uh, they were doing that business, obviously, in the Polish language. But that wasn't the language that I was speaking to my friend in. I was speaking with him in uh, Yiddish. The communities you're going to find are a more insular community. Right. And because they're more insular, they're also going to keep... And, and this is how the they find, like in Williamsburg, there, there are more... There are more insular community. They live kind of like, not in a negative way. I don't want it to come across as a negative way. They kind of live in the shtetl or in the ghetto in uh, Brooklyn itself. Between themselves, they will be speaking Yiddish. We want to stay separate. We live our own lives and carry on the traditions and as, as long as possible. And Yiddish plays a big role. Of course, because if, if, you, have, if you talk the same language, it's like everybody else, it's very easy to to assimilate. But if you have your own language, your own keeps you apart. Mm. Not because we hate others; it's just to protect ourselves. 
in the community that lives here, the Satmar Chassidim and other Chassidim like them, there's a, a, a real emphasis placed and a real value placed on tradition and the way things have been done by ancestors are the way things are meant to be done. To me, it sort of reminds me of this teaching that we get by the rabbis about the Jews in Egypt, why they were worthy of redemption from slavery, how they held on to some identity after all these years of bondage. And they say that they remained who they were, they remained a recognizable be people because they didn't change their names or the way they dressed or their language. And that's an ancient rabbinical precept. And to me, uh, I, I think about Yiddish in those terms also, that Jews didn't change their language or won't change their language. And that connects them and that gives them some sense of continuity. And so that's the case for the Jews here, that they hold on to this language as they hold on to their dress, as they hold on to names that have been passed down in the community and um, are a strong community today, uh, despite the ravages of the Holocaust. A lot of the people here living had parents or grandparents who were killed in the Holocaust, uh, but came here and sort of adopted Yiddish as the language of this community uh, that they would speak here in Brooklyn, this shtetl in Brooklyn, as sometimes people call it. The reason why Yiddish actually became a thing, like, like you, you, you move to a country, right? You, you just speak the language of the country. Why they had to maintain their own language, right? Why they had to maintain um, the Yiddish? So it's a lot of it. It's like Levi was mentioning that there was there was anti-Semitism. So if you the Jews, they were um, not allowed to do a lot of professions. They were not allowed to to own land. They had to do business a lot within themselves. They had to live in a certain place, a ghetto, you know, like a wall place only there they were supposed to live. All these things. So they were staying among themselves, a lot of it among themselves. They are dealing among themselves. They are talking among themselves. They're not going out so much. They're going out to the community to do business, to do different things, but they're staying more um, among themselves. So that creates a need, not a need, but just a consequence. It's just, it's just uh, everybody's among themselves. So they are talking their own language. They're not talking the language of, of the land. Until the Holocaust, about... Um, 90%, would you say 90% of the, the Jews? I would, I would say more. I, I would say probably uh, the, the, 18, uh, the late 1800s, 1897, 1898 census would say that um, 97 to 98% of Eastern European Jews spoke uh, uh, Yiddish. Uh, and um, the census will also say that uh, pre-World uh, War II, about 11 and a half million Jews spoke Yiddish. As the first language. As their first language. Right. Today, the numbers that you're discussing would be, there are about a quarter of a million Yiddish speakers in Brooklyn. Another quarter of a million, and pretty much mainly the Hasidic Jews. The Hasidim. You'll have another quarter of a million Yiddish speakers in Israel. And that's pretty much your half a million Yiddish speakers. Maybe you'll have another 100,000 throughout the entire um, uh, world, which I think th those numbers are actually accurate. So today, I would say that you probably have about 600,000 Yiddish speakers, and mainly in those two areas, um, versus you're going to have probably 9.5 to 11 million Hebrew speakers. Those numbers were different, as we were discussing before. The European numbers of Yiddish speakers was 11 million. There were 11 million Yiddish speakers um, pre-World War II. Everybody was pretty much, all the Euro Eastern European Jews were speaking Yiddish. That was about 11 million people. Today you'll have that same 11 million, but it's going to be speaking Hebrew. I find that a lot, and, and this is just my opinion, one man's opinion that Yiddish, except for by the Hasidic community, got replaced by Hebrew. Yiddish, uh, tragically so, in terms of, not in terms of having our own language, and not tragically because Hebrew exists, but tragically because Yiddish is such a gem of a language. Because we have our own uh, education system, you don't send our children to the public school. Mm -hmm. So that the school that your children go to is, is Yiddish, Yiddish only. 
and uh, we speak only Yiddish to them. Uh, so it's preserved because we grow up speaking only Yiddish, separate for boys, separate for girls, you know, go together. And uh, yeah, so we end up speaking yeah. only, only this language, you know, yeah. even though we learn it as a second language. It's Yiddish is still, we call it the mama lotion. The mother, the mother tongue. tongue, yeah. 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 Like up yeah. until 80 years ago, um, the majority of Jews spoke Yiddish as their first strongest language um, and lived in communities where people were not necessarily religious. Yeah, they lived, they lived, being secular. Yeah, they lived like largely secular lives. Like they, they, they still like lived within tradition. Like this, like there are things, like you know, religious tradition was alive. It wasn't necessarily thought of as being religious. It's like what you do as a Jew. Um, but, you know, like there, there, there was a time when like the, the masses, you know, like the, 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 the poor working masses of Jews spoke this language, you know, like kind of like not as a matter of principle, but because it was their language. First of all, why, um, why people don't speak? There's some people that speak, the Hasidim speak Yiddish and other, other Jews don't. But back in Europe, everybody spoke. Like, so what exactly changed? Yes, you could say, at least in my opinion, how I see it, there, is, there was no need really so much. There, there was a need in Europe for Yiddish because there was anti-Semitism and all that and you need to be within yourselves and you had to, you know, so you, you needed the Yiddish there. When they came to America, they didn't really need the Yiddish. So like even my family, I mean, your family, your parents are Russian. Um, my grandfather um, was Lithuanian. My grandmother was from the outskirts of Odessa, so you have that. Then from um, from uh, my father's side, what what Yiddish spoke by the way? So your, grandma, your grandmother, my grandmother's every every accent's going to be slightly different. My grandfather spoke a very uh, good Lithuanian Lithuanian Yiddish with the the shins and the sins. They 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 uh, switch the sh for the sir and the sir for the sh. So he had that. But his Yiddish was a really great Yiddish. Uh, my grandmother spoke um, a um, more Ukrainian style Yiddish. And uh, later on, when I got into accents and uh, kind of. Because they have a unique they, accent. They, they, they're like there's a Vos. Yes, a, a Vos, Vos. Uh, so you'll have, let's say, like, even, even with the Polish and, 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 and the uh, Russian Yiddish or the Hungarian. Yiddish, you're going to have a lot of different accents within itself of how you're saying those things. It's kind of like going to be listening to uh, a Northern American and a Southerner speaking. They'll be very different. You'll be able to understand it, but it's going to be really, really, really different. It's hot in Borough Park for a few years, and they speak the Polish Yiddish, and I speak the, the Russian Yiddish. And... I found three weeks later, I was able to give a class in their Yiddish. And they thought that I was actually a proper Satmer Chassid. <laughs> like that I, that I kind of like, because I, I don't have the, uh, the, the, the long payas uh, and I don't look like a Satmer Chassid. They thought I was kind of like an off the path Satmer Chassid. <laughs> and a lot of uh, later on, when I got into the jewelry business, a lot of my vendors, when I would speak to them, it just for fun, Obviously, I would speak to them in their Yiddish versus my Yiddish because I figured it's just easier. It, it takes a, a little bit of time. You have to get used to it. So instead of, I already know it. So I would speak to them in their Yiddish. And I, like, there were, like when they got a little friendlier or got to know me a little bit better, like a lot of them would be like, are you originally Satmer? Did you, did you leave Satmer for any particular reason? What's your story? And I'm like, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Chabad Lubavitch guy. I always was. And I just know how to do your, your, your accent. So The vast majority of Jews who speak Yiddish today are from Hasidic communities, not only here in Brooklyn, although this is the largest concentration. But there's also this wave of people, people like us, really, um, who are either rediscovering this language of their ancestors, people who spoke the language maybe just a couple generations before, or other young people who have just taken an interest in this language and this culture and uh, see themselves, a lot of these people, as in a way sort of inheritors, not just of the language, but of the whole secular culture and civilization, literature that arose in this language, especially sort of 
beginning in the 19th century, kind of the birth of modern Yiddish literature. So these are the people, whether they're in the academy or just young people learning it and speaking it in their sort of social circles that are by and large reading Yiddish literature today that is sort of modern secular Yiddish literature and engaging with it. I, I was in the summer program in Vilna and it was very powerful because we were in this former homeland for Yiddish in this Jerusalem of Lithuania, as Vilna used to be called, a place that is largely Yiddish free today. The Jews were exterminated, but for you know, six weeks in the summer, Yiddish could be heard often on the streets among young people. And we would speak it and we would sing Yiddish songs and we would feel connected to our past and our present and our future in a very special way. And then there's there's a question of like what like Yiddishism, like what future Yiddishism has, because like, you know, it, this is this is a it's this is a kind of a counterculture. It's like a group of people who have like made a choice, which is like in some way unnatural, which is like, you know, like I have friends who like I we both speak English natively. Um, but when we see each other, we speak Yiddish. And like this, you know, this is a thing that it's not that it takes effort, but it's like it's it's a conscious decision. And I think that it's like in a way sort of like it's conscious in a way that like, you know, people on the street in Williamsburg just like not even like like there's not even a question. Like, of course, they're going to be speaking Yiddish with, with each other because that's their language. It's not a language as a matter of choice. It's their language because it's their language. And I think that like Yiddishism, like. I, I, it's, it's an open question. Like, I don't, will there, I, you know, I've met, I've met children who, whose parents speak it, whose, you know, whose parents like came to start speaking Yiddish themselves as adults. And like now have, there's a, like an, it, the, the transmission was broken and then it was reestablished. Now they have kids whose first language is Yiddish. Hebrew is considered the holy like language. Uh, a lot of people in, in Williamsburg, especially, uh, encourage Yiddish to be the spoken language, right? Yeah, they're, they're kind of like, yeah. Yeah. kind of like there. Oh, there's also eventually they uh, Hebrew today Ivrit um, is kind of like a modern form of the holy language. Um, they are not necessarily um, uh, Zionists, so they're continuing to speak in their original mother tongue Yiddish. Um, and like I said, because they're living in the United States. There will be a lot of uh, English words that are mixed in there, but they're not necessarily um, learning Hebrew or using Hebrew uh, because it's kind of like it represents the Zionist ideas um, and ideals and um, the words that you're kind of using um, if are, are pretty much 80%, I would say, based on uh, the holy language, which is reserved for prayer or a Torah study, etc. Most Jews, the, the secular Jews, they right away drop it. Because they came to America or they came to Brazil, you don't need it, that's it. You know? uh, some Orthodox Jews also drop it. Like, see this as something that you have to fight for. You know, well, that was the language they spoke in Europe. But now we're not in Europe anymore. We could speak English and it's fine. It's, so, it's enough that we are Orthodox, that we follow the Torah, we follow our our customs, um, and that's it. We don't really need the extra thing that is Yiddish. Now, the Hasidic community, they, they, they kept it. They kept it more. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that we, we, we are proud of, something that we speak, something that was, was, was our identity in Europe. So we kept it over here. We continue over here. Now, between the two communities, you're going to be visiting, be visiting uh, Willensburg, and, and you are now in Crown Heights. So the difference between both of them, I would say, that Chabad, Lubavitch, is a more open community. So it's a more open community. So people come, and the language that everybody speaks is English, so became more of, a, of the language that the people speak is, is English in, in, in this community. So you're going to go to the street, you're going to hear English. You're going to see two kids in the street talking to each other or playing, they're going to be talking in English, not, not in Yiddish so much. Um, people still speak in Yiddish, the, the schools they teach, uh, they translate the the texts into Yiddish, so the the boys, the the the, the kids, they they end up having um, maybe not so fluent like the kids in Williamsburg, but they do understand and they do speak. If you're gonna go to Williamsburg and Borough Park, it's more ingrained, and it's uh, since that there's not so much newcomers, so they kept it as it is and they speak. Um, 
And you know, it's it's a beautiful thing. You know, like you come to a new country, you know, just you, there's no law that you have to take away the the customs and the language and everything that you had before. You could keep it. You know, you of course everybody has to. I I believe everybody has to be respectful to the country that they live. You know, and um, so so like everybody speaks English. Everybody. Um, everybody is American. They, they they are American as it is, but they speak. Uh, they kept their own language. That's the future of Yiddish has like two paths yeah. that won't necessarily have a lot in common. On the one hand, you have the Hasidic community, w which keeps on growing, and you know they're probably going to keep preserving the language. Um, but you also have um, a growing interest among more secular Jews, uh, especially Jews of. Of, of an Ashkenazi background who, whose ancestors, you know, might have spoken the language. You see a growing interest in Yiddish culture, including Yiddish music um, and things. And I was actually at a jazz club in Prague recently and I saw um, a performance by this Czech singer who sang a, the song in Yiddish called Asokole Akleina. Um, I'll say it in the Hasidic Yiddish version, Asokole Akleina, um, which is a very quintessentially Yiddish song about this Jewish family that makes um, a sukkah, the hut you make for the holiday of Sukkot. And it, the song describes the, you know, the cold wind that, you know, almost like knock the sukkah down and it blow out the candle, yet it stays standing. So I think the song really captures the like, the like Yiddish essence of preserving the culture and you know, trying to survive another day, and 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 keeping the traditions alive.